the common perception of public financial management is that it's something very technical, you know, that you can't understand it if you're not an accountant or a high-flying economist. But it's fundamentally about something that concerns us all, in the sense that when money is badly spent, we don't get good services, and when we as citizens don't get good services, we have less opportunities for our children and grandchildren. So in particular, in the context of a developing country, a good PFM system is usually a necessary condition for getting good development outcomes in terms of uh, um, improved uh, service delivery, reduced poverty, gender equality, etc. The problems you face in developing countries are not dramatically so very different to the problems you get in developed countries in the sense that public finance management is about allocating taxed resources to a limited range of areas and there's always going to be competition about what money gets allocated to and how much people should be taxed and who should be taxed and exactly the same issues that come up for example in the UK general election are exactly the issues that create conflict in a developing country sometimes violent conflict, in other occasions conflict which works itself through the system. And in a certain sense the idea of a good PFM system is to lay down a set of rules so that that conflict over how to tax people and how to allocate resources becomes a structured process. So rather than a conflict it's more like a, a constructive negotiation. It's different people arguing their points of view. Why should there be more money for higher education as opposed to more money for uh, electricity generation. Uh, there's reasonable points of view on both sides and with the right set of rules you can get that to work properly. So the very first stage is, is what we call policy development and interestingly there's no accountants involved in that. It's usually e economists and sector specialists, you know, educationists, health specialists, people like that. The next stage is where you begin to put a framework to make, to make that budgetable. So you, you, you calculate what are the resources available in terms of taxation, in terms of other types of resources that might come to government, what's the potential for borrowing, and on the basis of that you set a set of fiscal limits, overall limits for the process, usually within some sort of medium term. And we would describe that as the strategic programming phase. Then after the strategic programming phase you get down to the actual budget. In most countries it's an annual process, in the UK, it's a mix of an annual and a medium-term process. The budgeting process ends up with the executive making a proposal to the parliament. The parliament then votes it. Sometimes there would be amendments made by parliament. Otherwise, it's simply approved. Then you move to budget execution, which is when the different spending ministries are allocated their, their credit limits or their fund limits and they begin to spend and to, to, achieve result, to achieve results, hopefully. Linked to that is a whole, whole process of accounting and monitoring. And then the next phase is auditing and evaluation. So after the budget is finished, there's a process of examining on the audit side that procedures were properly followed and that results were achieved, and on the evaluation side that the right policies were, were pursued, that we couldn't have got better results with a different type of, of policy. And then that, of course, feeds back into the policy development process. So those are the six phases, all equally important, and all, as you might see, related to a range of things, not necessarily just about financial management. Virtually every country in the world has some kind of public finance act. And in that public finance act, that nearly always requires the executive to present a budget proposal to the legislature, to the parliament, and it requires the parliament to approve it. And even in more dictatorial regimes where you don't have a parliament, there is usually some sort of a council or some kind of a body that has to give its approval to the proposals that the president might, might put forward. So you'd be surprised. I, I, I actually can't think of any country in the world where there isn't some process like that in existence. Of course, in, in some countries, the information base is much better than others and the degree of access of normal citizens to the process is much better than others. Ideally, your policy development process should be an open process. It should you know, result in debates, in things on the television, on the radio, in the news, and normal citizens as well as you know, academics and others with specific interests should be able to comment. That's not always the case in, in, a, in a developing country. 
Um, and that's one of the things that in general we should try to push in reforming PFM to make it more transparent, to make it more accessible to people. Because obviously the more people can engage with policy debate, the more likely you are to get to better policies. Getting actors involved, it, it's really about two big things. One, it's about accountability. So the people who are in charge of getting something done, whether it's uh, making a school run or, or, or delivering road maintenance services, they've got to feel that they're responsible for that service and they've got to feel that they've had a hand in presenting the budget for that service. If they're just sort of given a budget and told, you know, get on with it, then they don't take a sufficient level of responsibility for what they've done. And if something goes wrong, so if the cost of road maintenance turns out to be exorbitantly high and the results terrible, potholes everywhere, then the question is asked, well, whose responsibility is it? And what will happen is that your local government will say, well, we asked for X much money and we asked for it to be made available in January, but we got Y, which was much less, and we didn't get it until six months into the year. So they will negate responsibility. And then you have to ask, well, who is responsible? So the whole idea of getting actors involved is to make it clear that the team of people responsible for delivering a service have had a hand in making the budget and in deciding what results are going to be generated from that. Other actors, citizens, uh, voters, should be involved because ideally they should have some say in what sort of priorities are chosen at the upper level and also in the ways in which services are delivered at the most local level. I, I think accountability is at the heart of any good PFM system. Um, and ideally reforms should build in accountability because the point is nobody really knows what's the best way to spend money. You know, people have researched for years what's the best way to provide education and we end up with different models of schools or, you know, different models of healthcare or whatever it might be. And if you accept that you're always learning, then that means that having different actors providing feedback and making suggestions and, and telling you when they're not satisfied is always going to be a positive thing and it's going to make the whole process better. And that's the idea is to put across that idea of accountability. So it's not just about um, you know, taking people to court when they've stolen money. It's also about giving them feedback and giving suggestions and, and promoting learning. That's, that's the point.